so I wrote a book called Behavior Mapping. It's a visual strategy for uh, teaching appropriate behavior to kids with autism. Now, before you think I don't work with kids with autism, this is a strategy I've worked with a ton of different kids. It's just that my publisher was Autism Asperger's Publishing Company, so they wanted the term autism in it. So know that this is a great strategy for teaching appropriate behaviors. And the strategy is really allowing kids to understand visually how the choices that they make lead to good things or reinforcement. So just to kind of tell you how it all got started, this is many years ago, I had a student with Asperger's syndrome and I had been working with kids with autism for a while and I knew from all of my training that visual supports are important for kids with autism, right? You should have visual schedules and social stories and all these different things that some of you have probably heard of. And this particular student, I was trying really hard to set up reinforcement for him to get his work done. I think math was specifically a very difficult area for him. And so I would say to him, okay, what do you wanna work for? And as soon as you get your math finished, you can take a break. But a lot of the things that I had in my classroom, he didn't seem very interested in. So he wasn't very motivated to do his math. And I was like, gosh, I need to find some good reinforcement if I don't have something to fill in that as soon as statement, as soon as you do this, you can have this. I was gonna really be limited in how motivated I could get him to do this math. Well, throughout the day, as he was in my classroom, he kept saying, oh, I got this new toy, can I bring it in and play with it at school? And, and at first I just kept saying no. Like I thought that that would be distracting if he brought things in from home. So what I really wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that I wasn't letting him bring things in that were, you know, that were gonna cause a distraction to the classroom. But after several weeks of not finding good reinforcement in my classroom, I thought, what the heck, I'll try it. So I thought, yes, I'll let him bring things in from home and those can be his free time things. So I got a, like a plastic tote kind of thing that I set right underneath his backpack hook. And I told him, as soon as you come in, anything that you bring in from home has to go in the bucket. You hang your backpack up, and then as soon as you finish your work, you can have five or 10 minutes to play with those things. So first day comes in, he brought some, uh, I think they were some Matchbox cars and maybe a, a, a magazine, like his Xbox game magazine or something, and he put that in there, no problem. We did math, he was great. Had no problems doing math. He was in fact doing it very quickly and, and, and wanting to get it finished so he could get to his free time thing. So I thought, oh, this is great. So he gets to his free time, pulls everything out of the box, starts playing with it. I had set a timer, I think for 10 minutes the first time. Timer goes off after 10 minutes and I said, okay, buddy, it's time to put it away so we can get back to work. Well, then he decided he didn't want to put it away. No, I want to keep playing, that wasn't enough time. And I said, well, the, when the timer goes off, you have to get back to work. You only get 10 minutes of time. As soon as you finish reading, you'll get 10 more minutes. But right now you have to put it away. No, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to put it away. I want to keep playing, I want to keep playing. I said, well, buddy, it's time to put it away. So if you don't put it away, I'm gonna help you because the timer went off. I wanted to be consistent, right? And so he's kind of refusing. So I went over and I started picking things up and putting them in the bucket for him because he wasn't putting them away. He completely lost it. I mean, he got angry, he was yelling. Now again, he had Asperger's syndrome, that high functioning autism. So not only was I stopping the free time, he was also concerned because I was violating a social rule to him, which is, you don't touch people's personal belongings without their permission. And so I kept saying, you know, hey buddy, if you put the stuff away when the timer goes off, I'll never have to touch it. But he wasn't getting it. Like every day he was still having trouble on these transitions. Well, I, you know, I'm setting stuff up in my classroom. I'm putting the visual schedule in place and different things. And I'm like, wait a minute. Every time I'm redirecting his behavior, I'm saying it to him. What do I know about kids with autism? They need visual supports. So I tried to figure out how can I make this visual? How can I make what I'm trying to explain to him visual? And so I did that with what I call a behavior map or some people talk about them as consequence maps. So you've got the first circle and here it says five minutes of free time. And so this is an example of this particular student. So he had five minutes of free time. And then you'll notice you can go one of two directions. If you go up at the top, it says that he could stop when the timer goes off and gets back to work. And then he can finish his work and earn five minutes of computer time. For him, he put five minutes in a bank for the end of the day. And then the next bubble says five minutes of time to play. So it shows that if you make this choice, this is the next thing that's gonna happen. If you go down below where it has the, the darker arrows, it says 
choose not to stop when the timer goes off and then Mrs. Smith is going to help you put your things away. And then the last one says if you refuse to work, you're gonna have to go sit in another classroom, which is what we did like when he was disruptive, we had him go to a different classroom so it wasn't so loud because he was upset and mad. And the thing is, is like he was not understanding the cause and effect because the timer would go off. He didn't wanna put his things away. I would put his things, he'd get mad because I touched them and then he'd stay mad for an hour. And at the end of the day, I would say, hey buddy, here's some math homework. He's like, I don't have math homework. I said, yeah, remember you got upset, so we never made it to math class. So you have to do this for homework. He's like, I don't have math homework. So he wasn't seeing that cause and effect. By using the behavior map, I could show that if you make this choice, this is the next thing that's gonna happen. But if you choose this thing, this is the next thing that was gonna happen. And that's all we needed to do was to make this visual. And you'll notice as well, there's different arrows that show ways of getting back on track if for some reason the child does make a choice that's leading to a, down a direction that they don't want to go. But all of these things can be very beneficial for kids to help them understand that cause and effect and basically see that when you have this good behavior, this good thing is going to happen. If you make an alternative choice, that good thing is probably not going to show up. And I'll show you lots of different examples of some of these behavior maps. So before beginning, really getting into the whole strategy of behavior maps is understanding that children with autism do benefit from visual supports. We know that from the research and there can be a number of things. We have done things like visual schedules. Uh, there's another webinar that I will do on that I'm doing on all of the uh, visual supports that you can have for kids with autism. And that includes things like visual schedules. There's things called social stories where kids learn how to respond in certain situations by reading a story that kind of tells them what the correct response should be. Uh, something we'll talk about called power cards that you might be familiar with where you're giving a set of rules with a reinforcing character and they're learning to follow those rules. All kinds of things, social behavior mapping, work prediction, reinforcement menus. We know visual supports are helpful for kids with autism because the research shows us that. But in my experience, everybody benefits from, from visual supports. People write things down on a calendar, they put it in their phone. Everything that we do, we write down in order to remember and so it's a good thing for lots and lots of kids. So there's different things like social stories. This is a book by Carol Gray. Carol Gray is the one that did social stories and she's got a lot of good work. Uh, the Power Cards by Elisa Gagnon is another one out of the Autism Asperger's Publishing Company. She does a really good job on teaching these power cards that are a really good way to motivate kids to follow directions. Michelle Garcia Winter has a book on social behavior mapping that's here that you can look at that really looks at teaching like appropriate responses in social situations. All very, very good social strategies and, and behavior strategies for kids. And because they're all visual, we know that they're gonna be beneficial. That's the great thing about behavior mapping is that it's also a visual support. So the research shows that this is going to be beneficial. Now, it is evidence-based in a few single subject studies. One was in 2006 by Brown and Miranda on contingency mapping. And then Toblin and Simpsons, Rich Simpsons out of the University of Kansas City, um, he called them consequence maps. So I just like to include that research. All of it uh, showed some really great results with these kids. But you know, initially many years ago, I called them behavior maps. Brown and Miranda called them contingency maps. Toblin and Sim Simpson called them consequence maps. So just so you know, they're all kind of interchangeable. All of those things can be the same thing in terms of how this mapping works to help teach kids how cause and effect and that their choices lead to good things. So it, it's also evidence-based from the National Autism Center. So there's all kinds of things that the National Autism Center has pulled together in terms of lots of research to show what is beneficial and what is evidence-based for kids with autism. So making choices and using positive reinforcement modeling, behavior mapping includes all of these things. Uh, understanding behavior just a little bit uh, is understanding that behaviors are messages, that we understand that behaviors happen for a reason. So for those of you that are familiar with this, this may be a review, but we look at different things like escape, like kids trying to 
get out of doing something. You know, they, they don't want to write and they're disruptive and they're sent out of the classroom. And when they're out of the classroom, they're not writing. So it's working for them. I had this little guy, I went in to do a consultation. He had Prater Willie, cute little guy sitting at the table. The teacher says, okay, here's some work to do. He punched her and she's like, oh, you have to have nice hands. Go sit in the safe spot, which was this little area with some padding on the floor. And he took a two hour nap. Well, that's an escape behavior, right? I don't want to work and now I'm laying on the mat taking a two hour nap. So that was something that was working for him. We can also have things like tangible um, where we talk about you know, kids that don't have the communication skills to say that they're hungry and so they scream because they want something to eat. Uh, the sensory behaviors that we see are even that attention. Um, kids trying to get a reaction or when you walk away from a student, they use behavior because that makes you come back and attend to them in some way. So we always want to complete that functional assessment first to figure out why the behavior is occurring. And so sometimes again, the teacher presents work, there's behavior and they're sent out, that can reinforce that behavior. We have also can talk about things like positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So positive reinforcement is when kids are given some type of reinforcement following a behavior. So a child that raises their hand gets a sticker on the sticker chart. After five stickers, they get to look at their favorite book. That's positive reinforcement. And positive reinforcement is an effect, not a thing, in that it changes behavior, it increases behavior. And so those are things that we need to kind of recognize before putting the behavior maps in place because we have to understand why is the behavior occurring and we have to know how can we put this positive reinforcement in place so we can teach new behavior. So one of the things that I always try to teach people throughout my training is that when a problem behavior occurs, we oftentimes ask ourselves, what should I do about this behavior? And instead, we want to ask the question, what do we want them to do instead? So we think the child is screaming. Oh, well, they should have a consequence for screaming. No, what do we want them to do instead? Oh, we want them to ask for something to eat because they're hungry. Then how do I reinforce that? And that's the big question that you need when you're working on behavior maps, is you need to be able to ask that question, what do I want them to do instead? Because that's how you're gonna make your behavior map. You're gonna make your behavior map or your consequence map by saying, okay, here's this expectation. When you make this choice, the what do you want to do instead, this reinforcement is gonna show up. But if you make this choice, maybe not the best behavior choice, the reinforcement is not gonna show up. And so it helps map that out and make that visual for kids. Now, another strategy that we talk about, if you want to kind of really think about it in terms of behavior analysis and behavior strategies, is what we call functional communication training. And functional communication training is an intervention where someone requests something functionally equivalent to his or her problem behavior and receives it. So what does that mean? I've given the example before in some of my trainings where a little girl was screaming, she was nonverbal, had autism, and after screaming a couple times in the kitchen, mom stopped and went to go get her a snack. Okay, well this little girl is screaming because she's hungry, and when she screams because she doesn't have language, mom fixes her a snack. So functional communication training would teach communication that meets the same function. So how could she communicate and get the same need met? What is the need? She's hungry. So she's screaming to get food. If I'm using something called functional communication training, I'm gonna teach her to ask to get food, right? And it could be a number of ways depending on her skill level. We could teach her to sign eat or sign more, or she could hand a card, a picture of some sort to her mom that says, I'm hungry, please. Or maybe even working on some vocal language. But these are all things that we would teach her in what we call this functional communication training and those are the kinds of things that we're going to be putting in the language maps and the behavior maps and the consequence maps to teach kids how to communicate and how to get the reinforcement for good behavior so a couple of examples of functional communication training let's say a child um, when he wants to uh, take a break he throws his work so he doesn't want to work anymore and he throws it Something that we could do for functional communication training was for him to say, hey, I need a break, and that's going to replace the throwing. Um, if he's hungry, he screams. We just talked about this one. He could ask for food instead of screaming. Last one I had talked about um, is uh, when a student wants to play, he tugs on the child's shirt. Well, what could we teach him instead to still get that peer's attention? Will you play with me? Can you play with me? You know 
trying to offer a game or something? Do you want to do the computer right now? Anything that can replace that behavior but still need, meets that same need. So a consequence map has a number of things. It identifies an area where problem behavior frequently occurs and it maps out two separate responses. So if there's a problem behavior, we would want to ask what do we want them to do instead? So we show that situation where there might be the potential for a problem behavior and there's two choices. We map out those choices visually. So one choice would be what do we want them to do instead? And the other choice would be the problem behavior. So we have one path on the map that shows the alternative responses and that results in reinforcement or some kind of a reward of some sort. And the other path on the map shows the problem behavior and how that reward doesn't show up. We don't look at punishment, we don't look at consequences, like the kids are in trouble for using that behavior, but rather in order to get the reinforcer, you have to do this good thing. And when you do, reinforcer is going to show up. And I'll, I'll show you a bunch of examples here. Here's the first one, Andrew makes copies. So Andrew is one of our students who would sometimes hit and refuse to work, but his favorite thing to do was to make a copy on the copy machine. So you can see in this map, we've got Andrew here. And if you go on the top part of the map, we have a picture where Andrew's working nicely. It says no hitting. He's got his hands on the table, looks very compliant. And you'll notice then that the last picture is a picture of the copy machine. He gets to make a copy on the copy machine. Now this is why it's important to have effective reinforcers because why would a kid make a copy on the copy machine? Because for him, that increased his behavior. He loved to do that. But if you look on the bottom, part of the map, it shows that when he doesn't work, so it's signing no work, and he's hitting, there's a picture of him hitting, then there's the picture of the copy machine and you'll see it has an X through it. So it shows that if you take this path by having good behavior, working hard, not hitting, you get to make a copy, but if you refuse to work or hit, you don't get to make a copy. And so that just helps to map out exactly what those consequences are, and by making this visual, there's a lot of situations and a lot of data that we have that show that this is what's helping to decrease some of the problem behaviors and increase the good behaviors because kids can clearly see how they can get reinforcement for doing the right thing. So this is another one. This was one that I used for a student. Um, it says, I can have a good day. So uh, this was actually a, a little guy that when he was frustrated, he would go to a quiet room. It was a small room and, and it was somewhere where they had they used to use it for like a timeout for kids, but he just used it as a, I need to chill out. And there was like, it wasn't he wasn't in trouble when he was in that room. He would just go in this room and he would chill out and we'd leave the door open. He'd just kind of hang out in there. But sometimes he wanted to hang out in there all day. Sometimes he was frustrated. So I wanted to give him this map. And so you'll see the first uh, expectation or in the bubble, it says I'm in the quiet room. So if you look at the, up at the top, it says, I want to try again and do my work. I can have some free time and I can still have a good day. So even though he got frustrated, he went into the quiet room. I wanted him to see that at any time you can choose to come out, you can get back on track and you can still have a good day. Because sometimes when he would go in the quiet room, he'd be upset for the whole rest of the day. In fact, that happened pretty frequently. So the other part of the path says that I want to stay in the quiet room and I do not get any free time and I will have homework to do. So I wanted to show him that if you decide to sit in the in the quiet room all day because you want to chill out and take a break, no more free time is happening today and what you don't get finished is gonna end up being for homework. So I wanted to show him that. Now, sometimes when I showed him the map, he'd get mad, like he'd wad it up and he'd throw it at me. He's like, I don't wanna talk about the behavior map. So you'll see on the bottom, I added another circle there and it says, I need more time to think about my choices. Sometimes he just wasn't ready. So I could give him that, I laminated it so he couldn't wad it up anymore and basically said, if you wanna tell me you're not ready to make a choice, that's fine. But I would present that to him so that he was able to say, okay, I'm ready to get back to work so I can so I can get some free time or no, nope, I'm just gonna chill out here all day. Okay, but remember that means you're gonna have homework and it, it would get him back on track. Like I said, it used to be that he would have an issue like this and he would be finished the whole rest of the day. This showed him, okay, this is how I get out and this is how I get back to having a good day. So it was really, really helpful for him. This is another one that I had for a student that uh, had to do math. So it says, I have math to do, I can get my math finished, I can ask for help, I can ask for a break, and when I'm finished, I get free time. Or if you go on the bottom path, it says I can refuse to do my math, 
It says I can get angry when I don't understand and I will not get any free time. But notice on this one, normally the arrows, um, I, I use green arrows to show the good choices, right? Those are the, those are the good paths, kind of helping kids understand that green light means go. It's kind of the direction you want to go. And then on the bottom is where I use the red arrows to say, stop, you know, this might not be the best path, just to kind of help reinforce those kinds of skills. But you'll notice on this one, even if kids take the bottom path, the red path that says, I refuse to do my math and I can get angry when I don't understand, notice on this map, there are arrows that are going back up to the top where I can get my math finished and I can ask for help. In other words, when kids can correct their behavior, we want them to be able to do that. If you have a student that says, I have math, and they say, I'm not doing my math, they don't automatically have to continue down that path. You can show them the behavior map and you can say, okay, you're refusing to do math. Now look, if you, if you get angry when you don't understand, then you're not gonna get your free time. But look here, you can ask for help, you can ask for a break, and it allows kids to figure out, oh, well, just because I'm refusing doesn't mean I can't get back on track and still get free time. So it's a nice visual way to help kids figure out what they need to do in order to be successful. Uh, another one, this is my same student, Andrew. And another thing that he loved to do, he had kind of a, some odd reinforcers. He was the one that loved to make copies on the copy machine. He loved to hold on to a marker with a lid, just like a Crayola marker with a lid, and he would take the lid on and off and click it. And that was something that he liked to work for. So you'll see in this one, here's Andrew. If Andrew keeps the marker out of his mouth, he gets the marker. So what was going on? What was the problem behavior? He was taking the lid off and putting it in his mouth. And some of it was probably some attention seeking behavior because then people are trying to get it out of his mouth and he's laughing, but we were worried he was gonna choke on it. And we, we could have just said, you know, Andrew, you can't put the marker in your mouth, give it back to me. And that's giving him attention, just that wasn't working very well. So we just had this map, right? If you use the marker appropriately, you can have it. If you put it in your mouth, no marker. And there's the picture of the marker with the X through it. So it really just kind of helped him understand that here's the expectation, you're welcome to have the marker, but you have to use it appropriately. And if you don't, the marker's going away. Well, this was all we needed for him to, to be able to really make the appropriate choice. Uh, this was a middle school student, study hall. So study hall is sixth hour. You can see on the top here, I can get my work done quietly. When my work is done, I can have Mrs. Mr. Jones check it, and then I can go to the computer lab. So this was a kid that was kind of goofing off because down on the bottom it says I can goof off, talk, and not do my work. Mr. Jones will send me to in-school suspension and I will not get my computer time. So this was just a way to say, look, if you get your work finished, you get some computer time. If you want to sit here and goof off, you're going to have to go down to the ISS room to be able to finish your work. And so it was just a nice way. And, and you'll notice it doesn't need pictures. When kids can read, we just write those things out so that kids can understand. And a lot of times you can um, uh, basically show it to them one or two times and, and they, then they get it. You know, you don't need to show it to them all the time. Again, recognize this one also has the arrow going back. So if he first chooses to goof off, talk, not do his work, someone could present the map and say, hey, look, if you're, if you're doing these things, this is the path you're heading down, but you can get back on track and go ahead and get your work finished. And sometimes that will nicely redirect kids to get back on track. Uh, another one, this is a student Branson that we had um, at the center. And when he keeps his hands to himself and uses a quiet voice, he gets free time. If he hits somebody or uses a loud voice, he doesn't get free time. So this is just a very simple behavior map with pictures. Now, it's important to understand that reinforcement piece, right? There's a piece that includes how we reinforce appropriate behavior. If we're gonna do a behavior map and we say, hey, if you use a quiet voice, you get, we need to be able to fill that in. So positive behavior support means reinforcing the student's correct behavior and developing those reinforcers are an important part of the assessment. So what if you say to me, I don't have any reinforcers for this kid? Well, there's always gonna be something that's reinforcing for a child. And sometimes that just takes time to figure out what those things are. You could do something called a preference assessment where you're asking kids, what is it that you like to do? Sometimes I'll give it to parents and I'll find out, hey, this kid really likes Legos. I can go find some Legos. Um, I might have a student who really likes to play with cars and trucks. We had these little guys from that were in kindergarten. We needed to come up with something to put on their consequence map or their behavior map. We didn't know what they liked. They were new kids to us. And so I told the paraprofessional, I'm like, go over to early childhood, bring five toys over, let's see what they play with. 
The things they don't, we'll take them back. And we just kind of kept switching things out. Well, we immediately figured out that it's like a rug that has um, like roads and cars and, or roads and buildings on it. And they could play with trucks and tractors and stuff. That was like their favorite thing in the whole world. They loved it. So now I have a really good reinforcer and I oftentimes have to take some time to figure out what those things are. Again, you can't even make a consequence map if you don't know what the reinforcer is because you can't say, hey, if you do really well, you can do more work. You know, you have to be able to fill that in. So those consequence maps really help the team, the teacher, the pair, the parent, whoever, to make sure that reinforcement is in place because that's what's gonna be the most important thing to change behavior and teach good behavior. So another one, Mrs. Smith assigns morning work. You can finish, she can finish her work and when she's finished, she can look at books or she can sit and refuse, will not get to look at books. So this is just a very simple one for someone who just really kind of can only really understand a very basic behavior map, but all of them can be very helpful. So things to know about behavior maps and consequence maps is again, using the color such as red and green can be helpful to show the preferred choice. And when the student has the opportunity to correct his or her behavior, you want to indicate that on the behavior map. Now, in the behavior map that we looked at where Andrew was working on making copies, if he hit someone, he did not get to make a copy, okay? He wouldn't be able to correct that. You can't have a child that hits and then, oh, okay, you can go ahead and make a copy. But if there are times like where a kid is refusing, they can still correct that, we wanna indicate that. And behavior maps can be either pictures or words. It could be either one, depending on whether or not the child can read or not. So a couple of stories about how I used behavior maps. Uh, usually you can use them kind of how I described as something that happens before a behavior to try to work as a preventative strategy. And so here's my story with this kid. We had a, this is when I was at the Center for Autism still as the executive director, I founded the school, Kids with Autism. Uh, and we had this kid that started Mike. He was a great kid. He had Down syndrome, uh, autism. He was really funny, loved to have him be a part of our class. Another significant part, which you'll understand why it's significant in the minute, in minute is that he weighed almost 300 pounds. So he was a big kid, but really, really fun to be around. And his first day he starts with us and I had a schedule for him, right? I had pictures that showed all the things that he was gonna do for the day. And right after lunch, there was a picture of our playground. Well, he saw that right away. He walks in and he's like, play. He, he usually just spoke in like one or two words. He's like, play. I was like, yeah, we're gonna play. He's like, swing. I'm like, yeah, there's swings. And so he was excited. He kept referring to what we were doing after lunch. And so he, he did, had a great first day doing all of his work, everything, because he wanted to go to recess. So it's time for recess. At the time, when I first opened the Center for Autism, we were in a storefront. It was just this small little storefront school with some classrooms. So basically you walk outside and you're in a parking lot. Luckily, we were right across the street from a school. So I asked them, hey, there's times when you don't have any kids on the playground, could we use the playground so that our kids had a place to go? That's where Mike was gonna go on the playground. And we had worked that out with the school district. It was some something that we had to include though, had to do with our insurance policies where their kids couldn't be on the playground at the same time my kids. But that was never really a problem. We went out, we had our 15 minute recess time, and then we went back in and it was working out very well. So we finally get to go to recess. Mike's excited, we walk across to get to the playground. He goes over and he decides he wants to go down the slide. So he climbs up to the top of the stairs, he sits on the top of the slide, and then he refuses to come down. So we're like, come on, Mike. He's like, mm-mm and he refused to move. Well, that's the only reason that his weight is significant because I couldn't do anything about it. He was gonna sit there until he was ready to come down on his own. And he refused for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, still refusing. Now I've got the, the school, cause we're not supposed to be on the playground anymore. The school has like 30, 40 some third graders ready to come outside to have recess and they can't because of the way our insurance is set up. I've got several third grade teachers that are about to miss their plan time. So they're not very happy. The principal's not very happy, but I can't get Mike off of the slide. And he, he basically stayed on till the end of the day. It wasn't until his mom came to pick him up that he came down. So it was like two hours that he sat there and refused. So he went on for the day and um, all my staff were 
uh, you know, kind of cleaning up for the day and I'm in my office and I have two staff members, two of them that were working with Mike come into my office immediately and they're like, Amy, please tell me we do not have to take him to recess again. You know, that was awful. And I said, well, I'm not sure that I want to take it away because we haven't put any supports in place for him to be successful. And he really seemed to be excited about it. So it might be a really good reinforcer for him. And I said, let's think about this. What do I always tell you guys? I want you to ask, what do you want him to do instead? So he's refusing to come in. What do you want him to do instead? Well, we want him to come in when the timer goes off. Great. And what do we know about teaching new behavior? We need to reinforce it. Okay, so when he comes in from recess, which is what we want him to do instead, what does he usually have to do? Work. Okay, so then we're not reinforcing the what do we want him to do instead or the alternative behavior. He has to come in and do math. Of course he doesn't want to come in. So how can we reinforce that alternative behavior? How can we reinforce the what do you want him to do instead? How about when he comes in, when the timer goes off, as soon as he comes in, he can have 10 minutes of SpongeBob, which was his favorite thing to do. It sounded like a great idea. So the other thing that we did is we made a behavior map. So here's the example, here's Mike. Mike walks in from recess. He gets some time on the computer where he did SpongeBob or he refuses and you can see the picture. He's just refusing and upset and then there's no computer. So we showed this to him right before we went to recess every day and said, Mike, okay, when the timer goes off, you can come in, then you get SpongeBob. But if you refuse, no SpongeBob. We never had the problem again. One, because we had appropriate reinforcement set up and two, we made it visual. So it was very, like he understood it. It was very clear to him what he was supposed to do. And so so it's just a, an example of how what was a pretty significant difficult behavior on a particular day was solved just by you know giving that behavior map to him now another example that i want to give is that sometimes you can use behavior maps by um, having like during the behavior, so like actually while the behavior is occurring can sometimes help kids to become redirected. So this was another consultation I was doing in Missouri and I was actually there to watch this little girl and all the kids left for the day. I you know, finished my observation, I'm sitting down at the desk talking to the teacher. And all of a sudden the paras, these two paras bring this little boy back in and he's kicking and screaming and yelling. And that was not even the kid I was there for that day, but he's like upset mad, yelling, he's trying to hit and kicking. And so we immediately get up, we're like, what's going on? Well, grandma had come to pick him up and he thought it was supposed to be mom. So kids that don't like those changes in schedule, he's like, I'm not going with grandma. I'm not if mom was supposed to be here. She promised she was gonna be here. So he's refusing. The teacher's like, oh my gosh, this happened last week. I told mom to please tell us when grandma was coming. She's like, last time this happened, I was here until 5.30 when mom could finally get here. She's like, I don't wanna do this again, which I totally understand. I said, have you guys tried a behavior map? I said, no. So I sat down, you know, he, was a, he wasn't, as long as we weren't pushing him to go see grandma or get in the car with grandma, he was just kind of sitting in a, a, on the floor uh, next to the chalkboard in the classroom. He's like, I'm not going, I'm not going. You know, he's mad, but he wasn't really outwardly hitting or anything. So I sat down next to him with a blank piece of paper. And I basically took the paper and I just kind of started drawing. I'm not good at drawing. So we're talking about some very basic stick figures here, but I drew the little picture that I said was Joey, whatever his name is. And then I started working on the path that goes on the top part of the behavior map. Like here's Joey and I drew a little car and I wrote under there, like go home with grandma. And then I put, I said, what do you, do you ever have a snack when you get home? And he's like, yeah, I have cookies or something. So I drew that in the little picture. And then I said, what else, what else do you do? Like before mom gets home, do you have to do your homework? He's like, no, I get to play with my cousin, Mike. Oh, okay. So I put two little stick figures like he was playing. And then I kept drawing and on the bottom, I put the picture with the car and I put an X through it. I put the picture with the cookies and I put an X through it and I put a picture with him playing with his cousin and I put an X through it. And then I sat with him and I said, okay, here's the deal. You go home with grandma, you get your cookies and you get to play with your cousin. If you don't go home with grandma, no cookies, no cousin. And here's an example of what it looks like. This is not the actual behavior map because he ended up taking it with him, but this kind of illustrates with little stick figures, which are, this is even much better than anything I was able to draw. Um, but you have the stick figures of the little guy, go home with grandma, get a snack, get to play with your cousin, or refusing, you don't get to play with your cousin. So I went through this with him. And I can't say like he picked it up and he was skipping and whistling his way to grandma's. I mean, he was not thrilled about it, but he knew that the only way to get from point A to point B, which was to go home and play with his cousin, is he had to go with grandma. And so he took the map, it was kind of 
wrong, you know, you know, just crushing it up, but he was taken in and he's like, fine, I'll go. And he went with grandma. And that was really good because before they had tried all kinds of strategies. And again, the teacher ended up having to stay until 5.30 until mom showed up. So we were able to get him. So sometimes you can use a behavior map to say, okay, this is what's happening right now. And if you make this choice, you can get yourself, you know, through some of these things to get to an end result that you want. Now, if we want to work on be making a behavior map, um, you can kind of think about this. This is Joey, he's a nine-year-old boy with autism in the general education classroom, and he loves to play outside and swing on a swing set. He frequently uses a loud voice in class and shouts out questions or comments without raising his hand, and he learns best with pictures. So if you were given that scenario, you have this little guy in your classroom, he's shouting out, he's using a loud voice, and we know he loves to go on the swing set, how could we make a behavior map? That would be really simple. We have Joey, he raises his hand, right? That's what you would want him to do instead, instead of shouting out. And then he gets to play on the swing. But if he shouts out and doesn't raise his hand, no swing. So here's an example of what that might look like. Here's Joey, um, maybe he's walking in from recess and he gets to go to the swing or he's refusing to come in from recess and he does not go outside. So these are just different kinds of examples. Here's another one, Joey goes to math, he completes all of it and he gets the iPad. Joey refuses, Joey does not get the iPad. Now, notice these behavior maps are a little bit different. They have their um, uh, stock images of pictures. So let me tell you a little bit about that story. I had a guy that worked for me, Eric, phenomenal, great behavior assistant, he worked with the kids, and he was also uh, illustrated children's books and was an author. And he worked as a paraprofessional with us while he was uh, continuing to, to work on his degree to be able to teach art. And all of those behavior maps that we've looked at so far that were pictures were all his work. I mean, I could literally go in and say, Eric, I need a behavior map, and he could make it in five minutes, and they were beautiful. And all of them look exactly like the kids and very, very talented. Well, he gets a job teaching some art classes at the community college. We were very glad he was able to finally get the this position, but it meant we lost our artist. And I realized, oh my gosh, these are really hard to make. If you don't know how to draw, you have to find pictures, cut them out, try to make the maps. So a colleague in my, of mine, Tara Hayes, she and I uh, own the company, Learning Momentum, and uh, along with my husband, and we put this program together in order to help people who are not good at drawing. And so you'll see with the pictures, like here's Joey, Joey um, is, a, is a little boy with brown hair and you can see him sitting at his desk and he gets the iPad. So basically the program allows you by using a template to put all of these pictures in and make a behavior map if you can't draw. Now again, there might be kids that don't need drawings uh, that you can write the behavior maps just with words. But if you have kids that need drawing, uh, need pictures, this is an absolutely fabulous uh, resource. So the website is behaviormappingmaker.com. And you can look at that at any time to see if that would be something that would be uh, beneficial for you as well. I'm gonna show you a couple of screenshots just to show you kind of how it works so you get an idea of what you would be what you would be doing. So when you open up the program, you get this template you can see. And over on the side here, we have all of these stock images of kids. So all of the kids that we put on there are basically different uh, kids of different ethnicities and hair colors and eye color and all that kind of stuff. So there was a, a wide variety of kids to choose from. Now, if I go to the next page, you can see that when I click on that circle and then click on that particular picture, it goes right into the behavior map. So now I have a student here that I can put some kind of an expectation. Now, if I go up on the top, I can uh, click on the first picture of the top part of the behavior map. And again, I get this whole menu and these are all good behaviors. So like this one, this kid is coming in from recess. You can see the other one on the menu there where the child is like got all his work finished and he got an A plus on his, on his work. So there's a whole bunch of them. And then I click again down on the bottom now and I have a whole list of problem behaviors. I always tell people it was so funny when we were working with the graphic artist because I said I need a picture of a kid spinning and refusing to come in from recess and kidding, kicking and she's like, why do you need these pictures? I'm like, this is special education. This kind of stuff happens in my world. But she did a fabulous job. I think these are pictures, these pictures are great compared to anything that I've seen. But you can see here, we've got a kid refusing to come in from recess. Then I can click on the top, right? And that one basically gives you a whole menu of pictures for the reinforcers, the computer, the iPad going outside. And then on the bottom, it gives me that same list of reinforcers with an X through it. So I'm able to then make that behavior map. 
Notice also underneath there's a text box, so I can then fill in the text that Jennifer goes to recess. She comes inside with her class and gets computer time, or she refuses and there's no computer time. And you can see on the bottom, you can save these maps or print them. The other nice feature with the Behavior Mapping Maker is that if you have kids that need real pictures, like for example, my student that really liked to make copies on a copy machine, those are not listed as a possible reinforcer, right? They're more unique. I have more of the general kinds of things as your, as your choices in the menu. You can take a picture with your phone, upload it to the menu, and then those pictures can be used. So you can actually have a real photograph of the student or you can have a real photograph of some of the reinforcers. The only difference is if you upload it into the problem behavior uh, side where you have the reinforcer, there was no way of me being able to upload that picture and have an X on it. So you'll have to print it with your picture that you took a picture of and, and added in there and you'll have to put the X on there, but that's super easy to do. These print landscape full size in color and you can save as many of them many of them as you want. So if this is something that would be beneficial for your class because you work with kids with, with uh, behaviors that need pictures as a support, I highly recommend you look into this because it's very, very helpful.